Okay, I guess we're gonna get started. Um, my name is Cindy McCormick. I'm from the Department of Public Works for the city. Um, I'm one of the deputy directors and I'm the project manager for the Duke Street project. Um, with me tonight, I have uh, Steve Campbell, who is the director of public works. We also have um, Chris Rip Banner, who works for the consultant WRA, and they are the design engineers for this project. Also with us, um, Carl Grable is in the back. He's a planner with the Department of Public Works and also working on the project. Um, DJ Ramsey is recording this event so that we can post this on Engage for people that are not able to attend. And Diana Black is, um, also works for the Department of Public Works and helps with the coordination of this meeting. So um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. This has been, um, we've had a couple outreaches related to Duke Street and um, we are trying to work through some improvements for the corridor, including you know, calming the traffic, improving pedestrian safety. Um, so these are you know, important things to us and making sure that we're accommodating all modes of travel, whether people are biking, walking, driving, or riding transit. We wanna make sure we're accommodating all them with this project. Um, I do wanna clarify one of the things about this project. We're focusing on um, the right of way or what we call the street um, with this project. We do have plans in the future to look more closely at the mall area, you know, the area on the other side of Duke Street um, to try and do some planning related to that. So there'll be much more outreach related to that. If you have any um, concerns or input on it, you know, we welcome that, but we will be having additional input related to that project. For this project, we do plan on having one more meeting. So this isn't the, the final plan or anything. We are still looking for your feedback and input related to the project. So um, there will be another meeting before we go into any kind of final design. So um, we really appreciate everyone coming out and I'm gonna uh, send it over to Steve Campbell to, uh, for a few remarks. Thank you very much, Cindy. And thank you again for joining us. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So thank you again for joining us. We're very, very excited about this project. As many of you know, it's a long time in coming. Uh, community engagement is, is never a perfect science, but we believe that we're uh, coming out to the public as much as possible these days, and we're trying to get as much of your input in a variety of different ways as we possibly can. Over the last several months, we've been canvassing the neighborhood. We've been present at the mayor's uh, the mayor's evenings, we've been present at the San Juan Batista Festival and had other opportunities to meet with or present information to you. Also on the Engage Lancaster website is where we've been able to, to collect a, a lot of the information uh, and data and your opinions that are very important to us. A lot of today's presentation is re-presenting to you not only what we heard when we asked questions and confirmed from you, did we get it right or do we need to understand it differently, but also some implications about what you told us and how that may affect the design itself. There is a preferred proposed option, which is, is reflected by the data that came in from you guys. And we're hoping that by having this kind of a, a conversation, we'll be able to understand better what you need and how you need it. Uh, can you just go on to the next, the first slide? So Cindy has started with the project, the welcome and introductions, the project overview. She's given a, a brief project overview and we want, I want to reiterate that this is a project in the, in the midst of a variety of other initiatives as well. So although this is just spearheading the part for the public right of way and therefore there will be other efforts for the park, the linear park, et cetera, I want to remind people that we will in January or early next year be starting a parks master plan, which is where we at a citywide level are going to try to understand what the parks needs are, what the active recreation, passive recreation needs are. We're looking forward to the park system becoming a network of recreation facilities so that you know at any one place in the city, where can I go for basketball, for skateboarding, for whatever. And this linear park is going to be, of course, part of that parks master planning effort as well. Um, we, 
we'll be in this presentation we're going to be presenting a little bit about what the existing conditions tell us and what the public survey tells us we'll be he'll be describing to you some of the the concept development what that looks like why it looks like what it does and we'll be looking for increased public comment so uh, to we cannot say it enough that it is an iterative process it's a back and forth we want to get your opinions we want to to test those opinions sometimes we want to ask you what do you mean by this when you say this um, so that we have better clarity about what that means and what that looks like um, the preferred alternative is based on the data that we've already received from you and that's what we're focusing on but the input from you may make some adjustments to that as well and then of course we'll go into next steps so why is public input important it's because this is your community you are the experts of what goes on in your community you are the experts on what you need how you need it how it's currently used how it is likely to be used and what we can do to make your enjoyment of the facilities as best as humanly possible i'm going to turn it over to chris now so that he can get go forward with the rest of the presentation at this particular moment if i understand correctly we're expecting that you would we would make most of the presentation straight through and we will be entertaining comments and questions towards the tail end however i'm suggesting to him that if there are good stopping points along the way we might stop part way through the presentation so that you can ask some questions and then keep on going we want to make sure that it's as clear as possible to everybody thank you very much chris oh, you are you, you are set up And anyone who's in the back, if you wish, you can come forward. There's more space up, up front as well. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, as you can see. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good now. All right. I don't have to hold it. So as just to reiterate, the city has been working with the community to identify ways to improve South Dew Street between Church Street and Chesapeake Street. Uh, a lot of the tools that we use thus far has been the Engage Lancaster platform. We have done public outreach with paper surveys from door to door. And we have done public events, including the Duke Street pop-up event during Mayor's Week uh, to conduct public outreach. So as we can see here, this is the limits of our project that we are looking to improve with the multimodal grant that we received, which extends from Church Street down to the intersection with Chesapeake Street. So. Uh, as part of this uh, project, the city has established a vision zero goal, which is to eliminate traffic related deaths and serious injuries by 2030. And how does that tie into Duke Street? Duke Street is on the city's high injury network, uh, which includes the streets with the highest number of crashes, especially those involving pedestrians and cyclists. Um, next slide. And this just is just a map of what we have, uh, have been identified as a high injury network within the city of Lancaster. And as we can see within our project limits, uh, we have South Duke Street. So that ties into, next slide. And here, this is just a, a collection of PennDOT data that has identified actual reportable crashes. And within our project limits from Chesapeake to Church Street, there really isn't one identifiable block that we can say this is where we're having a crash issue, this is where we need to focus. We actually are trying to identify ways to improve the entire corridor because we have crashes spread along from Church Street all the way down to Chesapeake Street. So it's just another visual to show that we have uh, a, a, some a crash history here along the corridor. 
So South Duke Street is actually re a recom it's, uh, part of the recommended bikeway network in the city active transportation plan. Active transportation, just to give you some insight, is just means of walking and cycling, active ways to get around the city. And again, here is the over, here is the bicycle network that is uh, planned for the city of Lancaster. And Duke Street is a, identified as a thoroughfare for bicyclists, uh, for, for this uh, bicycle network. Next slide. So, as it was previously stated, the city did receive a $1.2 million PennDOT grant to address these bicycle and safety issues for Duke Street. Uh, however, this is a multimodal grant, which means it must be used to make walking and bicycling safer, more comfortable, and more convenient. So for the existing conditions, what did we do to get started? Our team, we did an initial first look. We came out, walked the corridor, and uh, tried to identify areas that we felt would need improvement. But before we put any pens to paper to identify some plans, our project team actually came out and we did an initial uh, survey on Engage Lancaster, and we also distributed paper surveys to collect information to try to see what the community felt were issues along the corridor. And we actually collected more than 232 responses during the survey period between March and May of this spring. And if you've been active on Engage, you may have seen this pie chart already, but this is just, this is what was identified from the existing condition survey from the community as far as what are issues uh, throughout the corridor. And as we can see, a lot of it is really evenly distributed, but a big one was unsafe traffic speeds, street lighting, and multimodal accommodations, pedestrian safety, uh, access to bus stops, uh, fits into that category that was identified uh, for, for this. So using this data, that's when we started to identify, look at the corridor itself and say, how can we address these issues Within the, within the street right away to uh, make, make improvements for these concerns. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. You said those were from the Engage survey? It was from both the Engage and, 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 and the paper survey. survey. Yep. So we use this to start developing some concepts to survey data to develop two alternatives to address these concerns raised by the public. And we did focus on, on developing concepts to address the traffic speed, improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists along the Duke Street corridor. Based on this feedback, two concepts were developed for public comment. One was a separated bike lane, and another one was the shared use path. Once these concepts were developed, we came back out to the community in public events. Uh, we, we organized a pop-up event right here on Duke Street during Neighborhoods Week. And we also presented these concepts uh, for comment at the San Juan Batista Festival. And they were also posted on the Engage Lancaster uh, website for comment on there as well, to try to gather as much information as we could. So just to give you a, an idea of how we went through here, uh, for example, from, for the Turkey Hill down to Green Street, this was concept number one, uh, which was the separated bike lane. A separated bike lane, is a, it's physically separated from the roadway and, it, and it's separated from the sidewalk. So we had, a, we had a sidewalk for pedestrian, cyclists, and motor vehicles. We were proposing to do curb extensions to really tighten up the roadway typical section. That also shortens up your pedestrian crossing distances. And in an effort when you do cur uh, curb extensions, that is an effort to, as a, it's a traffic calming method to actually slow down traffic along the corridor. So, and as well as reconstructing sidewalks that's in poor condition because that was also cited with a lot of our public outreach. That was part of option one and then Option two was the shared use path, where we put a, uh, extended a path along the Duke Street Mall 
which would be both for pedestrians and cyclists, using the available space that is left, converting parallel parking to angle parking, uh, also provides more parking spaces along the corridor, while also using the same concept of curb extensions to one, shorten up crossing distances and really try to slow traffic down that's going through the corridor from Church Street to Chesapeake Street. So again, this is just another example from Dolphin Street and Juniata Street of how the typical section would look when these concepts were presented to the public. Here's the existing condition of how wide the pavement is with the, with the extra wide shoulders. Really trying to sh uh, pull that in and just really narrow down your, your perception driving the corridor to slow traffic down, provide areas for cyclists, as well as re-identifying uh, re and moving the curb line on Dolphin Street because this bus stop is heavily used and we wanted to provide a full pullout area for buses to get buses off the travel way and potentially reconstruct that bus stop because it's, that was also identified as the com what the community was interested in. And moving on to option two, providing the shared use path off the roadway, utilizing the, the extra space to increase parking along the south side of Duke Street, as well as using, still be using uh, curb extensions to uh, address pedestrian safety for that corridor. So this is just what we tried to do, just to give the uh, community an idea of what we were proposing. This is an aerial shot of our Duke Street pop-up event back in uh, end of June during Mayor's Week. We came out and actually uh, striped off a section by the elementary school to show what a separated bike lane would look like. And we had some members of the community come out and ride it. And so we had that sectioned off just so you can get an idea of how that would interact in real time, just to give you a, a sense of what it would look like. Next slide. And we also had a uh, table set up like we did here and just to collect input at the actual event uh, from the community. And we also did this, uh, we didn't do the pop-up again, but we did come out and set up our two concepts for comment at the, I think, next slide, at the uh, yeah, San Juan Batista Festival, July 28th through the 31st. Because we were just, yes. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide. So after we had those public events and we had the information posted on Engage Lancaster, we collected additional responses for what really, uh, what really hit home with the community as far as what concept they preferred. And the shared use path is what came back as the preferred alternative for the corridor. And within those responses, there was additional feedback that they wanted to see addressed with our con when we went back to the table and refined the concepts. Next slide. Of those 86 responses, it really was concentrated into four categories, which again was ensuring that we address pedestrian safety for the corridor, additional street lighting along the corridor, making sure that we address traffic speeds with our preferred concepts. And finally, try to find areas to incorporate public art, plant trees, and is there any way we can have more trash receptacles or just address the trash that's accumulated at certain sections along the corridor. So using that information, and there it is, just broke, and that's broken down. It's outside of additional street lighting, it's evenly distributed, distributed uh, through the comments that we received from that. So again, we took that information, we took our shared use path concept and went back to refine it even further to try to incorporate all as many of these uh, uh, concerns that we could. So we moved forward with the shared use path and we, uh, the shared use path was further refined to address these public comments. 
So here was the concept of the shared use path. And this is down at the Church Street intersection. And this is the refined section. And really, we were trying to focus on making sure that we provided the shared use path with a connection to both into the city and further up Church Street and really focus on maintaining, trying to bring, uh, shorten up crossing distances where we could to further uh, address pedestrian safety at this intersection. Uh, moving further down the corridor, here is the concept for the shared use path from Howard Avenue down to North Street and here's our refined shared use path. You'll notice the big difference at this location. We got a lot of feedback for the uh, raised concrete median at this block. So we were thrown on a concept of what that block would look like if you reduced it down to just the Belco Credit Union and opened up left turns down to Locust Street. As you can see, a lot rather than having all the curb extensions, we rather than having those be all concrete, that gives you, us an opportunity for green space for additional trees and or uh, rain gardens to clean storm, that the, to address storm water. A couple different options that we can do there and where we can uh, incorporate additional trash receptacles along the corridor as requested, so. On which side? Excuse me? On which side? Where the trash is kept? They generally, we generally find them on both sides of the street. It's yeah, just, yeah. That, that, it's gonna come down, uh, that's, that's yeah, yep. We have about 18 of them just purchased that we just did. We were trying to find people to adopt them in order to put them in. Right. We already have them on the other side, both on every corner of them. Yeah. I think this is down at Dalton. Down at Dalton. 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 I think someone's down so at Dalton Street. Down at Belco, because they wasn't empty yet, so we moved them in. A stock of development didn't come in empty enough, and I got tired of calling my mom. <laughs> we, so we called Fredo and had him move it up in front of the barbershop. Now they emptied it on each occasion. So I'm, I'm just wondering where we can talk about traffic uh -huh. Yeah. And, and that, that's a con that's a more in-depth conversation yeah. as, as far as placement and maintenance so and another big concern was we we understand that this median was being used a lot as a pedestrian refuge so trying to eliminate that's not was not the original intent we what's that Pede uh, people walking out and standing in the middle of the median trying to cross the street where there's not an actual crosswalk so we were actually going to provide a crosswalk, provide a curb extension, shorten up that distance, and provide an actual area. So it, it's more about driver-pedestrian interaction. If a driver sees a crosswalk, they expect to see pedestrians there, and there, that reduces the likelihood of an accident. And that was, at Locust, I mean, that was in the middle of the block? Before. Yeah, right there at Locust Street. So. Yeah, well, yeah, then Locust Street. Yep. So moving further down the corridor, here we are at uh, down Turkey Hill to Green Street. You'll see the, the biggest difference is trying to identify areas that would be available for green space to address trees, again, bioretention. Um, also proposed uh, for increasing pedestrian safety, we are proposing a rapid rectangular rapid flash or beacon at the Green Street. <laughs> at the Green Street Crossing because this is the main thoroughfare to the, to the school campus. If you've been around the city, you, the rapid flash or beaker, it does not flash unless someone comes up and activates it. When it flashes, it stops traffic in both directions so you can cross safely and not have to worry about traffic. So uh, it's, we have much success in, in uh, installing these around where, you, particularly around school campuses, so. Yeah. yeah. And well, it, yeah, it does. It definitely, it's, it's so it's it's yeah, the, the biggest difference with the rectangular than a yellow flasher, oh. yellow flasher is one 24 hours a day. People get numb and just then just to get used to it. With a rectangular, rec that only activates until someone flashes it and it's bright 
and it lights up the street even at nighttime. So it's, if you go up there and look at it and go up there and push it, you, you, it, 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 it yeah, it, it's a small light show and traffic, traffic respects it then. See, so, and then that's, that's, that's what we're, we're finding. Much success with those. Uh, so then moving further down the corridor, uh, this is where, yeah, the, uh, down from Dolphin Street to Juniata, again, reincorporating the, where we can find areas to improve um, vegetation bioretention, and also trying to, where we can provide even just shortening up this crossing distance for the Boys and Girls Club, shortening up a crossing distance from, tw from 30 to 25 feet may not sound like much, but you have to remember what a curb extension, I want to stress this point, what a curb extension does, it actually gets, provides a safe space to get pedestrians out from behind parked cars so people traveling along the corridor can actually see someone wants to cross the street. Before you'd be uh, parallel parking, if there's not a curb extension, you can be concealed by a uh, parked car and hence we're trying to we're trying to reduce that uh, that friction between pedestrians and motorists to improve the safety along the corridor. And here uh, there is existing street lighting along the corridor, and that's where we're proposing to replace. Right now, the the, the light head just lights up the street. We're currently proposing to replace that with a double head, so you have one head shining on the street and the other head shining on the uh, shared use path. The, des the design is not finalized, but that is the current proposal, and we are uh, hoping to get some feedback on that as well. I just didn't know how that would work with the, with the tree canopy, how it is now along South Street on the north side. Yeah. It's over the sidewalk, so we don't you won't be on the tree. So the lights are there now, even in the street, it doesn't reach down to the sidewalk because of the tree canopy. Yeah. So love our tree canopy, that's why the pedestrian value work needs yeah. And the bulb color is something very important. Like these guys have, right now there's like a ball of color yeah. in it. Instead of a nice clear white or, uh, you know, the bulb is just very dull. Well, I think I, I just toyed around my property. Yeah. Yeah. All of them are city, right? All the PGNL lights? They're not all along the city now, right? Yeah. The city recently acquired them. All of them, right? So there's all of them. Allows yeah. us to switch them out or, or turn them into a standard that works for the past. Yeah. The, the one issue, though, with the bright light, there is, there are, like, we try and adhere to dark sky standards, um, and if they're too bright, um, that, that, that has impacts on, you know, uh, I don't even know all the technical Ooh. terms. Well, I, I right, exactly. Like and well. nature, I know that, you know, it has impact. So we try and make sure we hit that balance of providing adequate lighting, but not being too bright where it has negative impacts as well. You know, when you guys get the color temperature is what, what they call it. So, so instead of that option, why, why is it, is the option, is it being considered what was done on Madden Street for this street or not? Those were some nice lights. That's what I just saw over. Yeah, I mean, that's, but, but I think uh. you're saying not in this one because they were really focusing on the street. But now that you're saying they're moving towards the shared right. lane for that, bike that and, right. and house, I mean, and people and pedestrians, yeah. I think that needs to be, you know, I mean, I think uh, that's no, you're right. You don't think of it as the style that was on Manor Street necessarily, no. but the approach would be to have significantly more lighting along that stretch is the intention here. The design of that and the height. I think we were just, we were stuck on that type of style. Right. Because that's the style the city only allowed to be put in for the desk. Because we're historic pedestrians, that's why they, you know. I see, depending on the kind of input we get here, and in this kind of a forum, we may be able to rethink that, or it may reinforce the idea that what's at matter is also appropriate here. So we, we again, yeah, I, would, I, would like to, I would like the motion that that be considered. Yeah, I second that motion. Okay. Me too. <laughs> okay. Is there anything resounding? <laughs> yes. It works. My name is Nosey. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, that wasn't caught in all. Yes, the discussion on the type of lighting that would be provided along the Duke Street corridor right now. I'll, one of the examples was the Manor Street lighting to be as a comparable. So, yes. And so, yeah, m moving further down, I don't know if we went f further than. No. So that's how we incorporated a lot of the, the comments we received from the summer into the refined concept that was just presented outside today. Uh, so we have to ask, does our description match what you see for South Duke Street? Okay. You agree? Okay. Only thing that only thing that only thing that wasn't there was the pedestrian lighting along the road side itself. Oh, pedestrian. Um, you might get some feedback, take like what you know, the Boricua Village and Charleston Council President really got by my grandma was in about the pedestrian lighting. The first year they didn't want trees or pedestrian lighting because they thought it was invading their privacy to force their there, but the way that the lights are now, they can put something inside that covers the walk side, at least have it on the street, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, that's the only thing I don't see on there. I wonder if this is taking up the island, but now it's being afraid of it. And uh, <laughs> I do hate driving up past Lopez, that's a, make an illegal U-turn, add Howard to come back down and turn on Lopez. So yeah, that's okay. something that, yeah, so, yeah, you may do that. So, yeah. Thank you. There's another question and I'll make it. Thank you for your comments. Yes. I want to talk if the uh, uh, public commentary that we did was house by house or was it uh, collected in only one thing? It was it was a lot of both. The, the I think you're going to have to take. I'll just hand this back to you. Yeah. I think. When we, when we, so the question was whether the information that we got when we canvassed, was it just done in one particular location or was it house by house? We actually did it house by house. We went house by house up and down Duke Street and one, and in one or two blocks on either side, house by house, leaving flyers or meeting with the person who answered the door to get the information recorded into the survey itself. In addition, there is the, sur the same survey was available on the Engage Lancaster website so that people could fill it out at their leisure or if they were not home or if it was not convenient for them, they could do it when it was convenient. So in and in addition to that, we hosted s two or three events. There was uh, the pop-up that was held in, on June 22nd uh, during Mayor's Neighborhood Week where we blocked off a block of North Street and striped the street to look like a separated bike lane and had people ride up and down that lane. And we collected information from that survey, from that moment, and then during the San Juan Bautista Festival, we had maps similar to what you see outside available to see what both of those options look like. And we were able to get input from people on every single night of the San Juan, the four nights of the San Juan Bautista Festival. It's an important neighborhood, so being able to do something like it's an important neighborhood, so being able to do something like that, I think, would be very nice. Yeah, it will be, yeah. 
Um, one of the other questions that Chris was asking was, did, this, did what you saw reflect what you understood as your preferences, or is there something either missing or something different than you thought? Are there, are there any things that... So I just want to make sure, are there other things that you didn't hear talked about that you feel need to be talked about? Okay, let me go on. Yeah, I think that, right. So just to give an idea of where we're at timeline-wise, uh, we're going to, again, take the opportunity to incorporate comments that we received tonight or the, uh, all this information it will be posted uh, to the Engage Lancaster website if you want to download or even take a survey with you and mail it in at a later time. And we're gonna take that opportunity to refine it even further and come back again to meet with the community before we uh, identify our preferred alternative in the next coming months and with the goal of being in construction in next in 2022, which, so. Um, yeah. Can I ask something before you the Oh, sure. Um, on the representation of the public, I'm sorry, on the representation of the public uh, residents, in the towers alone is 200 residents. In Hill Rise, how many? I'm sorry, I don't know. How many residents in Hill Rise? Units. And the response was how much? Units. Oh, no, units is 150 units. So in the first survey, there were 262 or 200? 232 responses. 232 responses in the first survey where we, where we canvassed and, re and canvas items went to those towers as well. And in the second, after uh, on the engaged Lancaster, there were 86. After, yeah, after, after, after the two festivals, the public presentations, and it was also available on the engaged Lancaster website, we got an additional 80, 82 response, 86 responses. Yeah. So roughly like a, a, rounded, a rounded like estimate, about 315. Um, 
and the and the door to door, what was your person to person response that someone actually talked to you? So we d I don't think we have numbers for that. I was uh, I was canvassing. Cindy McCormick was canvassing. Um, Diana Zyra were canvassing. The mayor canvassed for part of it. And we, w we literally would went door to door in the middle of the day. And if we were lucky and people were home, we were, and Millsy, Millsy canvassed as well. If people were home, we had the conversation with them with the survey in front of us. If they were not home, we still left the survey and asked people to, to respond and then made the survey available at the other public events as well. But I don't think we have, I, I, I don't offhand have the numbers of people that we spoke to in person during the, sur during the canvassing period. Do we have that? I don't have that option. Okay. From my experience, when I canvass in the evening, mm -hmm. it's a better turnout for person to person. As opposed when you leave a flyer, they will not give you any feedback. So I think the timing of mid engagement and knocking on door to door at lunchtime, I don't think that's, you're not gonna get a, a good person to person response and you're not gonna get a good input of the residents in the public. Do you think that also became the case with the four nights of San Juan Batista? Okay, I, th I thank you for that feedback. I think we're, we're always looking for better opportunities to find ways of reaching out to the public in the ways that we think will be most effective. As you can imagine, we don't have limitless staff resources, mm -hmm. so we do need to try a variety of different ways to get information, and I really appreciate that input. Um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize with the survey that you have this evening it does focus on not only what you like about the plan as you've seen it, but things that you might forget or things that you might not remember um, that you thought should have been included that were not included. We need this kind of input to continue to tweak and enhance this proposal so that the engineers will have a good sense of how far they should go with that design. If you can record, for instance, if you can write down some of the comments about lighting, about passage back and forth, that will be useful for us to see in your own words. I would also say thanks to everybody. You can thank you without folks taking time out to do this here tonight. We really have appreciated it. Uh, and, and please sign in. I have one more question. So sure. the next step is the final, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what, what are we presenting with that final design, yeah? We're, what we're ho you're asking a very, very important and very, very good question. The question is, if we don't like, the next, if the next step is final design and we don't like the final design, what then? What happens then? Our hope is that because we've got consensus at this meeting that what we've shown you represents accurately what you <coughs> believed, what you thought, what you hoped to see, that it is going to be a good direction forward. If you don't like the, the final design, it will likely be some details of the final design that you're not happy with. And we have the ability to tweak those. That's, that's very easy. But the hope is that we're not gonna get to a point where we've gone this far with a, and then someone says we want a separated bike lane. And, and that's a whole other concept. But the intention is, that we're gonna continue to tweak this. So the next piece is a final design, but it is not fully engineered. Here's why I switched the lights and they came along. You know, I frown upon sometimes the South Beach looking different than the other areas, that's number one. Number two, those lightings that are on Madison Street that are downtown, we are starting a nice with the Southeast area. It's Christmas and holiday time, we're starting to decorate a lot of agencies and a lot of houses are participating 
I think that's fantastic. And, and, and that's why I'm kind of like pushing that a little more. Uh, I, think it's, I think we should all look at like all four parts. You know? Very good. I, I very much appreciate those kinds of comments. I, and I want to re restate that we really, really appreciate not only everybody coming out here, but talk to your friends and relatives. We're, we want this to be a fully engaged process where you believe, you genuinely believe, that we're representing the needs that you have and that we're getting those needs addressed to your satisfaction. Not everyone's always going to be happy. We're all different people. We all have different experiences. But what I'm sensing here is that we seem to have rather accurately represented what your concerns were that were, were told us over the last several months. And we really need, uh, especially in this next phase, we need that input to make sure that we're not going astray. We're not going in the wrong direction. We really, really appreciate your time is valuable. It's really important to us that you are, you've taken out that time to share with us your ideas and your hopes. So I really, really appreciate that. Also, if you have not yet signed in, it would be great if you can sign in because this is also a way that we can make sure that we're reaching out to you if we need to and um, make sure that if there's a comment that is that's we don't quite understand, we could come back to you and find out more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>